Democrats to gavel back in this afternoon. They'll take up nearly a dozen suspension bills, including one dealing with a police alert system, a blue alert system for the injury or death of a uh, police officer or law, law enforcement official. Debates be debate between now and 6.30 and votes in the House after 6.30 Eastern. A number of congressional hearings happening today. We, we covered several on the C-SPAN networks, and you'll see those later in our program schedule. Now live to the House floor. Chair will, will postpone further proceedings today on motions to suspend the rules on which a recorded vote or the yeas and nays are ordered or on which the vote incurs objection under Clause 6 of Rule 20. Record votes on postponed questions will be taken after 6.30 p.m. today. For what purpose does the gentleman from North Carolina seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I move that the House suspend the rules and pass H.R. 1864, the Mobile Workforce State Income Tax Simplification Act of 2011, as amended. The clerk will report the title of the bill. H.R. 1864, a bill to limit the authority of states to tax certain income of employees for employment duties performed in other states. Pursuant to the rule of the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Coble, and the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Johnson, each will control 20 minutes. And the chair recognizes the gentleman from North Carolina. Mr. Uh, chair, Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all, all members may have five legislative days within which to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous materials on H.R. 1864 as amended currently under consideration. And with that objection, so ordered. I recognize myself, Mr. Speaker, with such time as I may consume. The gentleman is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I rise in support of H.R. 1864. On the way back from, to Washington, D.C. this past weekend, I looked around in my local airport and saw dozens of business travelers preparing to board airplanes to leave North Carolina and conduct business in other states. This happens, Mr. Speaker, every day in every state in America. The American workforce is more mobile in the 21st century than it has ever been. Nonetheless, the diversity of state income tax laws places a significant burden on people who travel for work and their employers, many of which are small businesses. Currently, 41 states tax the wages earned by a non-resident for work performed there. I do not take issue with the right of those states to impose an income tax, but I am concerned that the disparity of tax, of tax rules among those states is damaging small businesses and stifling economic growth. For example, some states require a non-resident to pay income tax if he or she works in that state for just one day. Other states do not collect tax until the non-resident works for a certain number of days in the particular jurisdiction. Small businesses must expend considerable resources just to figure out how much they must withhold for their traveling employees in 41 different jurisdictions. Employees are also confused about when their tax liability is triggered and in which states they must file a tax return. To alleviate this problem on May 12th, I introduced H.R. 1864, the Mobile Workforce State Income Tax Simplification Act, with the distinguished gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Johnson. The bill was introduced. The bill we introduced establishes a clear 30 day threshold for tax liability and employer withholding. Under the bill, states remain free to set any income tax rate they choose. Tax simplification on both the federal and state level will allow workers and employers to predict their tax liabilities with accuracy and expend fewer resources researching the nuances of each state's respective tax law. The money they would have spent hiring accountants and tax lawyers can then be spent on creating many meaningful jobs and growing the economy. I urge all members to cast a yes vote on this bill and reserve the balance of my time. Mr. The gentleman Speaker. from North Carolina reserves the balance of his time. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, today, I rise in strong support of H.R. 1864, the Mobile Workforce State 
Income Tax Simplification Act. This is an important bipartisan bill that will help all workers across the country. It will also help businesses large and small. I've been working on this bill since I was a freshman in the 110th Congress, at which time uh, Chris Cannon from Utah, former member, uh, was uh, the uh, lead sponsor. In the 111th Congress, uh, I was the lead sponsor uh, on H.R. 1864, as it is known now. Uh, this term, the uh, 112th, Mr. Coble, whom I've been quite pleased to work with, uh, has been the lead sponsor. And I'm, uh, again, uh, he's a good friend of mine, and I appreciate the opportunity to work with him. H.R. 1864 provides for a uniform and easily administered law that would ensure the correct amount of tax is withheld and paid to the states without the undue burden the current system places on employees and employers. From a national perspective, the Mobile Workforce Bill will vastly simplify the patchwork of existing inconsistent and confusing state rules. It would also reduce administrative costs to states and lessen compliance burdens on American workers. Take my home state of Georgia, for instance. In Atlanta, if an Atlanta-based employee of a St. Louis company travels to headquarters on a business trip once per year, that employee is required to file a, Mrs. a Missouri tax return even if her annual visit only lasts for one day. However, if that employee travels to Maine, she would not be required to file a Maine tax return unless her trip lasts for 10 days. If she travels to Arizona on business, she would only have to file an Arizona income tax return if she was in the state for more than 60 days. In each case, her employer is also liable for withholding those states' taxes out of her paycheck. And the only way she can avoid, avoid double taxation is if she files for a credit for each state's tax in her resident state. H.R. 1864 would fix this problem by establishing a uniform threshold before state income tax laws would apply to traveling employees. This bill would protect employees who perform employment duties in a non-resident state if they work in the state for less than 30 days. Until that threshold is reached, they will continue to pay in their state of residency. When I initially started working on this bill, the withholding threshold was 60 days. <coughs> and in response to the concerns by the Federation of Tax Administrators, I sought a compromise and lowered the threshold to 30 years, excuse me, 30 days. I understand that the FTA may still have some concerns about the bill, but I believe that it is, uh, it's a good bill that addresses the bulk of their concerns. The FTA's concerns have certainly not been ignored. In addition to lowering the day threshold, we also worked to clarify that the bill's operating rules would not be drafted to avoid paying withholding tax, and clarified that if an employer has a time and attendance system designed to allocate wages among states, it must be used. At a time when more and more Americans find themselves traveling for their job, this bill is a common sense solution that helps workers who are employed in multiple states by simplifying the tax reporting requirements for them and for their employers. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves for what purpose? The gentleman from North Carolina is recognized. Madam Speaker, we are prepared to close and I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman uh, from Georgia is recognized. I have no uh, uh, further uh, witnesses and so I'm prepared to close. From Georgia is recognized. Thank you. Madam Speaker, for the vast majority of states, this bill carries a minimal or no revenue impact. 
In fact, this bill would greatly increase compliance rates. This bill will greatly uh, end up saving states the administrative costs of processing and remitting thousands of small returns from uh, non-residents. While nothing is perfect, and the Federation of Tax Administrators, Administrators may still have some concerns, this bill is truly the product of years of working with the states on an approach that balances their concerns with administrative ease and efficiency for employers and employees. This is truly a bipartisan effort that seeks to simplify state tax compliance, not reduce state taxes. Thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from North Carolina is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I also yield back and urge my colleagues to cast a yes vote on this matter. The gentleman yields back. The question is, will the House suspend the rules and pass H.R. 1864 as amended? Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, two-thirds being in the affirmative, the rules are suspended and the bill is passed. And without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. What purpose does the gentleman from Texas seek recognition? Um, we don't have any sponsors here. Madam, Spe Madam Speaker, I move that the House suspend the rules and pass H.R. 4119, the Border Tunnel Prevention Act of 2012, as amended. The clerk will report the title of the bill. H.R. 4119, a bill to reduce the trafficking of drugs and to prevent human smuggling across the southwest border by deterring the construction and use of border tunnels. Pursuant to the rule, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Smith, the gentleman from Puerto Rico, Mr. Pierre Luisi, each will control 20 minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas. Madam Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days within which to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous materials on H.R. 4119 as amended, currently under consideration. Without objection. Madam Speaker, I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman's recognized. Madam Speaker, H.R. 4119, the Border Tunnel Prevention Act of 2012, strengthens current law and prohibits the construction, use, and financing of unauthorized tunnels across the U.S. border. I thank the sponsors of this legislation, Mr. Reyes of Texas and Mr. Quayle of Arizona, for their work on this bipartisan bicameral bill. Similar legislation passed the Senate by unanimous consent in January. This legislation establishes the penalty for conspiracy or attempt to use construction or finance a cross-border tunnel. It also identifies the construction, financing, or use of cross-border tunnel as a predicate offense for a charge of money laundering and for an application for judicial authorization to intercept wire, oral, or electronic communications. H.R. 4119 also allows the criminal forfeiture of property that enters the United States through a cross-border tunnel. Reports of drug smuggling tunnels have increased, particularly in the past 10 years. Drug traffickers have ramped up their use of underground smuggling in light of increased border security, either real or perceived. Mexican drug trafficking organizations have used tunnels as a smuggling method since at least 1990. A majority of cross-border tunnels continue to be found in California and Arizona. These tunnels range in sophistication from a simple 16-inch pipe to well-engineered tunnels equipped with electricity, ventilation, and rails. Ownership of the tunnels is often attributed to the Mexican drug cartels. To find cross-border tunnels, U.S. agents use devices that range from ground-penetrating radar to seismic sensors. Despite these efforts, drug smugglers continue to build the tunnels. In November 2011, federal law enforcement agents shut down two sophisticated tunnels that led from an, er an area near Tijuana's airport 
to an industrial park in the U.S. About 49 tons of marijuana was seized. Drug traffickers also at skilled at setting up front companies to rent space in busy warehouse districts in the United States. Mining engineers and architects are employed to construct the tunnel and bore directly into the foundation of the front company's rented warehouse. The Drug Enforcement Administration describes marijuana as, quote, the top revenue generator for Mexican drug trafficking organizations, a cash crop that finances corruption and the carnage of violence year after year, end quote. The profits from marijuana trafficking finance the drug cartel's other drug enterprises, which include the construction and use of cross-border tunnels. Border tunnels are an unfortunate testament to the ingenuity and determination of the Mexican drug cartels. It is time for Congress to enhance law enforcement's ability to fight transnational organized crime and the drug cartel's construction of cross-border tunnels. This bill reaffirms our determination to bring an end to the cross-border tunnels. When Congress enacted the Border Tunnel Statute in 2007, it admitted the changes contained in this bill. H.R. 4119 simply corrects this to ensure that investigators are equipped with the ability to locate and shut down these tunnels and hold these dangerous criminals accountable. I urge my colleagues to support this bipartisan legislation, and I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from Texas Reserves, the gentleman from Puerto Rico is recognized. Madam Speaker, I rise in support of H.R. 4119, the Border Tunnel Prevention Act of 2012. This bill would strengthen the laws that criminalize the use, construction, and financing of border tunnels. Increasingly, cross-border tunnels are being used to smuggle people, drugs, and contraband into the United States. They can even be used to smuggle terrorists or weapons of mass destruction into the country. Cross-border tunnels present a serious problem for law enforcement, and I support this bill's efforts to stop the growing use of these tunnels. This legislation is urgently needed because the number of tunnels has substantially increased in recent years. Whereas the first documented tunnel was discovered in, in 1990, the Department of Homeland Security reported last year that 154 attempted tunnels have been found since 1990, all but one of which were located along, along the southwest border. In addition, the sophistication of some of these tunnels is also increasingly increasing in recent years. Cross-border tunnels range from small hang-dog tunnels barely wide enough for a person to crawl through to professionally engineered tunnels built by the Mexican drug cartels. In November 20, 2010, an Immigration and Customs Enforcement Task Force discovered a tunnel with two separate entrances in warehouses in Otay Mesa, California. One of the tunnel's walls was fortified with wood and cinder block supports, and the tunnel was equipped with rail, electrical, and ventilation systems. The tunnel was being used to import large amounts of marijuana into the U.S. Current law already criminalizes the construction of a cross-border tunnel, allowing such a tunnel to be constructed on your property or the use of such a tunnel. H.R. 4119 would strengthen existing law by making it a crime to attempt to engage in any of these activities as well as to participate in any conspiracy involving any of these activities. The bill also makes the construction or use of a tunnel a predicate of offense for authorization of wiretaps, provides for criminal asset forfeiture of merchandise involved in tunneling, and includes a money laundering provision. Border tunnels present a real and serious threat as a burgeoning tool for criminal activities. I urge my colleagues to join me in supporting this measure, which will help enhance the safety of our na nation's borders. Madam Speaker, um, I, I would like to yield to the, uh, actually, I reserve the balance of my time. And reserves. The gentleman from Texas is recognized. I always ready to balance of my time, and we are prepared to close. Uh, Madam Speaker, I would like to yield to the gentleman from Texas as much time as he may consume to address the merits of this bill, which he co-sponsored. Uh, the gentleman from Texas is recognized. Th thank you, Madam Speaker, and I rise today to ask my colleagues 
for their support of H.R. 4119, the Border Tunnel Prevention Act of 2012. I also would like to express my appreciation and thank uh, my co-sponsors, Congressman Quayle, who I understand is on his way here and, and uh, we anticipate uh, that he'll be speaking on this, uh, Congressman uh, Chairman Dreyer uh, and uh, Congressman Thompson, and I would in particular like to thank my good friend uh, and colleague from Texas, Chairman uh, Smith, for his support in bringing this legislation uh, to the floor. I also would like to thank Senator Feinstein and Senator Kyle for their work on uh, a bipartisan, bicameral uh, piece of legislation uh, on the Senate side, which is Senate uh, uh, 1236, the companion to uh, the Border Tunnel Prevention Act of 2012. The Border Tunnel Prevention Act of 2012 strengthens the 2006 Border Tunnel Prevention Act, which made it a crime to construct or to finance an unauthorized tunnel or subterranean passage across an international border. This bill seeks to provide law enforcement officials with enhanced investigative tools and additional options for prosecuting crimes related to the construction and the financing of cross-border tunnels. The Border Tunnel Prevention Act of 2012 would criminalize the attempt or conspiracy to use, construct, or finance a cross-border tunnel and also permits the forfeiture of bulk cash and merchandise smuggled into the United States through these uh, illicit uh, passageways. Thanks to the collaborative efforts of the Obama, Obama administration, the Congress, federal, state, local, and tribal law enforcement organizations, as well as ordinary Americans, the southwest border is more secure than at any point in our nation's history. Over the past several years, the federal government has dedicated unprecedented levels of personnel, technology, and resources towards border security. As a result, apprehensions today are down, and seizures of drugs, guns, and cash are up. Border city cities are among the safest in the country, including El Paso, which for the second year in a row is the safest city in America with a population over half a million people. While the strengthening of security along the southwest border has produced impressive results, it has also led uh, those who want to harm our country to seek new ways to undermine our efforts. Enhancing the security of our borders on land, air, and sea has literally pushed drug cartels and transnational criminal organizations underground as they try to smuggle illicit drugs and, put, and people uh, and other types of contrabands uh, as my uh, good friend and colleague from Puerto Rico mentioned, to include the potential for terrorists and weapons of mass destruction uh, being smuggled into the United States. Over the last decade, drug cartels and transnational criminal organizations have been increasing both the use and complexity of cross-border tunnels. Uh, as was said earlier, approximately 154 tunnels have been discovered between Mexico and the United States uh, since the 1990s and more than 90 percent of those tunnels uh, have been detected in this past decade. These cross-border tunnels are becoming more and more complex. One such tunnel, and I've got a picture to show, and I know the, the chairman was mentioning uh, the complexity of uh, the construction. This, uh, this tunnel is the one that was discovered on Nove in November of 2011. It's, it was over 600 yards long, and you can see it's got a uh, uh, rail system built in. It's got sophisticated lighting and even uh, a, a system of, to an, introduce fresh air uh, into uh, the tunnel. So no longer are these uh, crude, uh, handmade tunnels. These are sophisticated, uh, well-engineered, and well-financed uh, uh, projects. Uh, so uh, that is why it is imperative that uh, this uh, legislation uh, be passed. We must give law enforcement officials the tools that they need to combat this growing threat to our national security and stop the flow of illicit drugs and other contraband into the United States. Accordingly, uh, I am proud to be the author of this along with uh, Congressman uh, Quayle and uh, urge all my colleagues in Congress uh, to pass this vital piece of bipartisan legislation uh, so that we can move forward with helping to defeat 
the drug cartels and the transnational uh, criminal organizations uh, and further continue the path towards really securing our borders and protecting our communities. So with that, let me end by thanking again uh, Chairman Smith and my good friend and colleague from Puerto Rico uh, and uh, urge my colleagues uh, to support this critical and vital uh, piece of legislation. And I yield back. The gentleman from Texas continues to reserve and the gentleman from Puerto Rico is recognized. I reserve the balance of our time. Uh, the gentleman from Texas has the right to close. The gentleman from Puerto Rico is recognized. I'm prepared to close. I, um, we have no further speakers, so I urge my colleagues to vote in favor of H.R. 4119, the Border Tunnel Protection Act of 2012. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Texas is recognized. I'm Madam Speaker, I'll yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman's recognized. Madam Chair, I just, Madam Speaker, I just wanted to say we were hoping that the other author, the other co-sponsor of this bill, the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Quayle, would be here. Unfortunately, he was uh, detained. His flight was delayed uh, from Arizona to Washington, D.C. Uh, but in his absence, I just want to thank him for his work on this bill and for all of his efforts to reduce the amount of cross-border uh, drug smuggling uh, and thereby protect the lives of individuals in Arizona and all Americans. He has done great work on this particular piece of legislation. We all appreciate uh, those efforts. Um, I'll yield back the balance of my time. Chairman from Texas yields back. The question is, will the House suspend the rules and pass H.R. 4119 as amended? Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the Chair, two-thirds being in the affirmative, the rules are suspended. The bill is passed. Madam Speaker, the I gentleman from Texas. Does the gentleman ask for the yeas and nays? Yes, I did. The yeas and nays are requested. All those in favor of taking this vote by the yeas and nays will rise and remain standing until counted. A sufficient number having arisen, the yeas and nays are ordered. Pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20, further proceedings on this question will be postponed. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas seek recognition? Madam Speaker, I move that the House suspend the rules and pass H.R. 365, the National Blue Alert Act of 2011, as amended. The clerk will report the title of the bill. H.R. 365, a bill to encourage, enhance, and integrate blue alert plans throughout the United States in order to, <clears throat> in order to disseminate information when a law enforcement officer is seriously injured or killed in the line of duty. Pursuant to the rule, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Smith, and the gentleman from Puerto Rico, Mr. Pierre Luisi, each will control 20 minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas. Madam Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days within which to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous materials on H.R. 365 as amended uh, currently under consideration. Without objection. Uh, Madam Speaker, I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman from Texas is recognized. Madam Speaker, in 1962, at the request of Congress, President Kennedy proclaimed today as National Peace Officers Memorial Day. Every May 15th, we honor our nation's law enforcement officers who have been killed in the line of duty. Earlier today, on the west front of the Capitol, we honored those officers who were killed last year while protecting us and enforcing the law. H.R. 365, the National Blue Alert Act of 2012, establishes a nationwide system for distribution of time-sensitive information to help identify a violent suspect when a law enforcement officer is injured or killed in the line of duty. Each year, hundreds of law enforcement officers are killed or seriously injured in the line of duty. America's law enforcement officers courageously put their lives on the line every day. They often work long and irregular hours in demanding and dangerous conditions. These officers run a high risk of being injured or killed by the same criminals that prey on Americans. 
Just last month in my home state of Texas, an Austin police officer was shot and killed while responding to a call about a drunk man shoplifting at the local Walmart. What seemed to be a routine call turned out to be a dangerous and deadly situation. We cannot bring Officer Padron back, but we can honor his sacrifice by helping to apprehend and bring to justice criminals who harm our men and women in blue. In 1789, President George Washington appointed America's first law enforcement officers, 13 United States Marshals. Since then, over 21,000 local, state, and federal law enforcement officers have been killed in the line of duty. Despite the fact that national crime rates continue to drop, in 2011, 163 law enforcement officers were killed in the line of duty, a 14% increase over the previous year. Unfortunately, criminals are becoming even more violent, and their contempt for law enforcement and the rule of law is more evident than ever. This bill encourages expansion of an integrated Blue Alert communications network throughout the United States, much like the well-known Amber Alert system used to locate mission and abducted children. A Blue Alert broadcasts information and speeds apprehension of violent criminals when a law enforcement officer is seriously injured or killed in the line of duty. Blue Alerts use the same principle as Amber Alerts for missing children and Silver Alerts for missing seniors. The Blue Alert system is a cooperative effort among local, state, and federal authorities, law enforcement agencies, and the general public. A Blue Alert provides a description of an offender who is still at large and may include a description of the offender's vehicle and license plate information. Like Amber Alerts, Blue Alerts will help hinder the offender's ability to escape and will facilitate their capture. The bill directs the Department of Justice to designate an existing officer as the Blue Alert National Coordinator who will encourage those states that have not already done so to develop Blue Alert plans and establish voluntary guidelines. As of today, 14 states have Blue Alert networks in place and Ohio will implement its network in June. An integrated nationwide Blue Alert system ensures that when tragedy strikes, the public is on notice and, and suspects can be more quickly apprehended and brought to justice. A nationwide Blue Alert network will be particularly effective when a suspect flees across state lines. And I want to thank the gentleman from New York, Mr. Grimm, and Mr. Reichert of Washington for their work on this issue. This is a bipartisan, bicameral bill. Similar legislation was approved by the Senate Judiciary Committee last September. Supporters of this legislation include the National Fraternal Order of Police, the National Sheriff's Association, the Federal Law Enforcement Officers Association, and the Sergeant's Benevolent Association. Too often, criminals in our society have no respect for authority and the rule of law. The goal of a blue alert is to immediately notify the entire community to assist in the location and apprehension of violent criminals who injure or kill police officers. This bill reaffirms our determination to ensure the future safety of our law enforcement men and women and the communities they serve to protect every day. I urge my colleagues to support this bipartisan legislation and I'll reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from Texas reserves. <clears throat> the gentleman from Puerto Rico is recognized. Madam Speaker, I rise in strong support of H.R. 365 and I yield myself as much time as I may consume to explain the bill and to respectfully urge my colleagues to vote for it. The National Blue Alert Act of 2012 has strong bipartisan backing and was approved unanimously by the Judiciary Committee on April 25. I'm proud to join my colleague, Mr. Grimm, as the lead Democratic sponsor of this legislation. And I want to thank the gentleman from New York, a former FBI agent, for his leadership on this and other law enforcement issues. This bill con constitutes an effort to protect and defend the men and women of law enforcement who protect and defend us, our families, and our communities. The bill has been endorsed, as has been stated by, by the gentleman from Texas, by the Federal Law Enforcement Officers Association, the Fraternal Order of Police, the National Association of Police Organizations, the National Sheriff's Association and the Sergeant's Benevolent Association. In our sister chamber, an identical companion bill to H.R. 365 has been approved by the Senate Judiciary Committee and currently awaits floor consideration. 
The legislation before us directs the Attorney General to establish a national blue alert communications network within the Department of Justice to disseminate information when a law enforcement officer is killed or seriously injured in the line of duty and the suspect has not yet been apprehended. A blue alert would provide a physical description of the suspect and may include a description of the suspect's vehicle and license plate information. The Blue Alert system is a cooperative effort among federal, state, and local authorities, law enforcement agencies, and the general public. The Blue Alert system would use the same infrastructure as Amber Alerts, which are disseminated for missing children, and Silver Alerts, which are disseminated for missing seniors. Pursuant to the bill, the Attorney General will assign an existing DOJ officer to serve as the national coordinator for the Blue Alert Communications Network. The national coordinator's duties will include encouraging state, territory, and local governments to develop Blue Alert plans, establishing voluntary guidelines for these government entities to use in developing such plans, developing protocols for efforts to apprehend suspects, and establishing an advisory group to assist state and local governments and law enforcement agencies create, facilitate, and promote Blue Alert plans. In the last 220 years, nearly 21,000 law enforcement officers have been killed in the line of duty in the United States, and many more have been seriously injured. In Puerto Rico, the jurisdiction I represent, over 325 law enforcement officers have been killed in the line of duty since 1900, with over 40 island officers killed between the year 2000 and the year 2010. This year, two veteran police of Puerto Rico officers have been fatally shot in the line of duty, Abimael Castro Berrocal and Francis Crespo Mandri. Although at least one suspect has been apprehended, other sp suspects in both of these killings remain at large. This morning, these two officers, along with over 160 of their brothers and sisters in law enforcement who lost their lives in the line of duty in the past year, were honored in front of the Capitol as part of the National Peace Officers Memorial Service. The overriding purpose of this legislation is to help deter violent acts against police officers and in the event such a violent act occurs, to ensure that the perpetrator is quickly apprehended and brought to justice. Police officers, unlike young children and seniors, are not a vulnerable po population group in the traditional sense. They are strong, capable and brave, but every day they put themselves in harm's way to protect us. They have our backs and it's important that we have theirs. I encourage all of my colleagues to vote in favor of this bill, and I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves. The gentleman from Texas is recognized. Madam Speaker, I yield five minutes to the gentleman from New York, Mr. Grimm, who is the sponsor of this legislation. The gentleman from New York is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity. This is truly a very special opportunity for me to speak on this bill, H.R. 365, the National Blue Alert Act of 2011. As a former FBI special agent, it makes it a very special honor to have the House consider this important legislation, especially during National Police Week. You think about it, thousands of law enforcement officers from around the world and this country are going to converge on our nation's capital to honor those that have paid the ultimate sacrifice to protect the citizens back at home. On a personal note, I'd like to extend my sincerest gratitude to New York City's Police Commissioner Ray Kelly and to the very brave men and women of the NYPD for their service to our great city. And I encourage all of my colleagues to treat every week as if it were National Police Week. Because truly, it's their sacrifices that are made by these individuals that have inspired me to introduce this important legislation. During my career in the FBI, I witnessed firsthand the danger posed by criminals who attack law enforcement officers and the particular threat that they pose on our communities. 
time and time again, we have seen that if criminals are willing to attack police officers to avoid apprehension, then there is no limit to the lengths they will go or the victims they will target simply to avoid justice. According to the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial Fund, 173 officers have been killed in the line of duty in 2011. As members of Congress representing New York City and Puerto Rico, it is a sad fact for myself and for my friend and colleague, Congressman Pierre Luisi, who is the lead co-sponsor of this bill, that the New York City Police Department and the Puerto Rico Police Department both lost four officers, the most of any other agency, in 2011. Now, it is impossible to completely transform the hazardous nature of the work our law enforcement officers carry out every single day. But there are steps that we can take to enhance their safety and quickly apprehend those who put them at risk. The National Blue Alert Act does this by creating a National Blue Alert communications network within the United States Department of Justice to disseminate information on suspects who are being sought in connection with the death or injury of a law enforcement officer. Similar to the nationwide Amber Alert system for missing children, the Blue Alert would rapidly notify law enforcement agencies, including the media and the public, to help aid in the apprehension of these extremely violent criminals. Additionally, this legislation would further encourage the expansion of the Blue Alert program beyond the handful of states where it is currently existing by helping develop a blue, the Blue Alert plans, the regional coordination, and the development and implementation of new technologies to improve Blue Alert communications. This legislation, as we have heard, is supported across the board by many law enforcement organizations, and I am certain that the National Blue Alert Act will enhance the safety of our communities as well as the law enforcement officers who protect them, and I encourage its swift passage in the full House of Representatives, and I'd like to thank my lead co-sponsor and friend, Mr. Pierre Luisi. With that, I yield back. The uh, gentleman from Texas will reserve. The gentleman from Puerto Rico is recognized. Madam Speaker, I yield to the gentleman from American Samoa as much time as he may consume to address the merits of this bill. The gentleman from American Samoa is recognized for such time as he may consume. Madam Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to extend and revise my remarks. Without objection. Madam Speaker, I would be remiss if I did not uh, certainly extend my uh, commendation to the gentleman from New York and my good friend and colleague from Puerto Rico for their leadership and their services in bringing this legislation before the floor, and more especially also <clears throat> for Chairman Smith and our ranking member, Mr. Conyers, for their support in bringing this uh, bill for consideration. Madam Speaker, I fully support the fundamental purpose of this bill, which is to create and integrate blue alert plans throughout the 50 states and U.S. territories in order to disseminate information when a law enforcement officer is seriously injured in the line of duty. This program is similar to the Silver Alert public notification system to broadcast information about missing persons, especially seniors with Alzheimer's disease or the America's Missing Broadcasting Emergency Response, known mainly as the Amber Alert, a public notification system about a missing child. Similarly, the intent of this legislation is to expeditiously apprehend the offenders that kill or hurt law enforcement officers. Law enforcement officers put their lives on the line every day to protect and to serve the public. Each year, hundreds of law enforcement officers are killed or seriously injured in line of duty. On average, one law enforcement officer is killed in the line of duty every 53 hours. Last year, 173 officers have been killed, up to 13 percent from 153 killed in the line of duty two years ago. The Blue Alert system is a cooperative effort among local, state, and federal authorities, law enforcement agencies, and the general public. It provides a description of an, off of an offender who is still at large and may include the description of the offender's vehicle and license plate information. Madam Speaker, I am concerned to learn just this morning that the initial provision for a grant program to be made available to states and territories 
in support of the blue alert system is nowhere to be found in the language of the bill. Instead, the current bill language will only provide that the Attorney General shall assign an existing officer of the Department of Justice to act as the national coordinator of the Blue Alert Communications Network. Madam Speaker, while establishing the Blue, while knowing that the Blue Alert system is not mandatory, resources should be made available to the 50 states and territories in order for the Blue Alert system network to work effectively and efficiently. Otherwise, the initial purpose of this bill will not be met under the current bill text before us today. However, I fully support the needs of the Blue Alert system. I urge that a grant program be made available to ensure that our law enforcement officers in the 50 states and territories are provided equal and fair treatment. And again, I want to thank Chairman Smith and Ranking Member Conyers for their support of this bill, and I urge my colleagues to support this legislation, and I yield back. The gentleman from Puerto Rico reserves his time. The gentleman from Texas is recognized. Um, Madam Speaker, we are prepared to close and reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves. Is the gentleman from Puerto Rico prepared to close? I, I have a speaker, uh, Madam Speaker. I would, like to yield, I would like to yield to the gentleman from Texas as much time as he may consume. The gentleman from Texas is recognized. Th thank you, Madam Speaker, and I just wanted to add my support for this legislation and thank my colleagues uh, from New York and Puerto Rico uh, for uh, uh, introducing this very important piece of legislation. As a former Border Patrol agent and uh, chief in the, in the United States Border Patrol, I uh, had the experience of working both as an agent with uh, all the other uh, law enforcement agencies and then as a chief. Uh, and I can tell you that there isn't a worse feeling than that phone call in the middle of the night that one of your uh, agents or one of your officers has been uh, uh, injured or, or killed. And that's why uh, this uh, legislation is so important, uh, not, uh, uh, not just to officers and agents across the country, but to their families. And uh, I... Uh, would urge strongly that our colleagues uh, uh, support this very important piece of legislation and agree with my colleague uh, from uh, American Samoa that uh, uh, more than just uh, uh, the, the legislation, we ought to uh, do everything that we can to provide the funding to actually uh, bring this uh, uh, critical program to fruition. Uh, so with that, again, uh, I wanted to thank uh, my colleagues and also Chairman Smith uh, for uh, uh, bringing this legislation uh, to the floor, and I ask all our colleagues to uh, strongly support it. And I yield back the balance of my time. Uh, the gentleman from Texas continues to reserve. The gentleman from Puerto Rico is recognized. Um, I have no further um, speakers, uh, so I'm ready to close. The gentleman is recognized. I, I yield back. The gentleman from Puerto Rico yields back. The gentleman from Texas... Madam Speaker, I yield back the balance of my time as well. The gentleman from Texas yields back. The question is, will the House suspend the rules and pass H.R. 365 as amended? Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, two-thirds being in the affirmative, the rules are suspended. The bill is passed. And without objection... Re request the yeas and nays, please. Madam Chair, request the yeas and nays. The yeas and nays are requested. All those in favor of taking the vote by the yeas and nays will rise and remain standing until counted. A sufficient number having arisen, the yeas and nays are ordered pursuant to Clause 8 of, the rule, of rule 20. Further proceedings on this question will be postponed. Does the gentleman from Texas seek recognition? Madam Speaker, I move that the House suspend the rules and pass H.R. 3534, the Security and Bonding Act for 2011, as amended. The clerk will report the title of the bill. Union, calendar number 322, H.R. 3534, a bill to amend Title 31, United States Code, to revise requirements related to assets pledged by a surety and for other purposes. Pursuant to the rule, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Smith, and the gentleman from Puerto Rico, Mr. Pierre Luisi, each will control 20 minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas.
Madam Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days within which to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous materials on H.R. 3534 as amended currently under consideration. Without objection. And Madam Speaker, I'll yield five minutes to the gentleman from New York, Mr. Hanna, who is the sponsor of this legislation. The gentleman from New York is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I introduced H.R. 3534 with my colleague, Mr. Mulvaney, from South Carolina, to address an issue in the construction in industry I know all too well, surety bonding. Bonding is not something most people think about, but it was a daily reality in my business. The concept is simple. Contractors on a federal construction project are required to post assets prior to entering a contract to prove that they are capable of paying their subcontractors and downstream paying their suppliers for work. It indicates that a contractor is capable of successfully completing a project and is supposed to protect taxpayers and small businesses downstream in the event of failure through or non-payment. The business of bonding is predicted on a zero failure rate. The assets pledged to back a project must be real, easily convertible to cash, and held by the contracting officer for the duration of the project, and most are. Unfortunately, a loophole in these laws has been exploited. It has resulted in a number of cases where assets pledged to back a bond issued by an individual surety have been insufficient or illusory. This has left small businesses and taxpayers without sufficient payment remedies, and in the case of one Colorado woman, nearly put her out of business. A single stock or private residence, which are subject to huge changes in value or may have an existing first mortgage, are quite simply not acceptable assets to, to back multi-million dollar projects. Madam Speaker, the Surety and Bonding Act will remedy this problem by requiring individual sureties to pledge solely those assets described in contracting laws as eligible obligations. Further, it would require them to be placed in custody of the federal government just as they would using a corporate surety or posting an asset in lieu of corporate surety. This loophole is putting small businesses and workers and the taxpayer at risk. It is time to close this loophole and restore the integrity of the bonding process. H.R. 3534 would ensure that if individual surety bond is furnished for a federal construction project, the small business and sub, that small businesses and subcontractors providing goods and services on that contract will not need to worry about the integrity of their payment remedy. This bill provides the surety that a small business needs, subcontractors, subcontractors and citizens deserve from the federal government. Without it, good jobs and our limited taxpayer dollars will continue to be at risk. In closing, I would like to extend a personal thanks to Chairman Lamar Smith for his leadership in advancing this legislation and for allowing me to join him during the committee's proceedings. Madam Speaker, I urge my colleagues to support this legislation and yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman from Texas Reserves, the gentleman from Puerto Rico is recognized. Madam Speaker, I rise in support of H.R. 3534, the Security in Bonding Act. H.R. 3534 will strengthen the protection that surety bonds are intended to provide by requiring individual sureties to use low-risk cash assets such as United States bonds as collateral. At the same time, H.R. 3534 will require the Government Accountability Office to assess the impact of these enhanced collateral requirements on the availability of surety bonds for emerging businesses and particularly disadvantaged business enterprises, seeking to be prime contractors on federal projects. When the federal government enters into a contract, the American taxpayer as well as those who subcontract with the contractor should be protected. That is why, under current law, any federal construction contract valued at $150,000 or more requires a surety bond as a condition of the contract being awarded. 
the bond will pay the government and downstream contractors in the event that the contractor fails to perform the contract. Bonds issued by so-called corporate sureties, which have been vetted and pre-approved by the Treasury Department, provide financial assurance to taxpayers and subcontractors in the event that a contractor fails to perform. On the other hand, bonds issued by individual sureties have not been so vetted and are not subject to strong collateral requirements. Accordingly, I support H.R. 3534 for several reasons. To begin with, any entity that provides a surety bond should be held to strong underwriting standards. For instance, we know very well what happens when industries, particularly those involving financing, are not closely regulated. Consider mortgage lenders, for example. In a vacuum of regulation, unscrupulous and predatory lenders engaged in practices that hurt not just their borrowers, but ultimately jeopardize the nation's economy and the financial well-being of all Americans. Measures such as H.R. 3534 are intended to mandate more reliable collateral standards, which is a commendable goal. Such strengthened requirements should help that ensure that American taxpayers are not made to pay for the consequences of under-collateralized bonds. In addition, this bill will, will protect so-called downstream subcontractors and suppliers who very much depend on the economic vitality and performance of the general contractor and its surety. Many such downstream subcontractors and suppliers are small businesses owned by members of historically disadvantaged groups, including racial minorities, women, and the disabled. Ensuring that unnecessarily heightened risk is avoided for minority-owned businesses is key to their economic survival as well as to our nation's fiscal health. According to the Commerce Department, these businesses are in an integral part of local, national, and global business communities. Measures such as H.R. 3534 that, that strengthen collateral requirements lessen the incidence of poor underwriting practices and undersecured surety bonds. Finally, H.R. 3534, as amended in committee, will help to ensure that it does not result in too much of a good thing. Particularly during these difficult economic times, our role in Congress should not be to construct unnecessary or overly burdensome hurdles to those who want to enter into particular business or industry. To the extent that heightened collateral requirements might dissuade individual sureties from providing bonds on federal projects, there is a risk that new businesses may have a more difficult time bidding on federal projects. We need to ensure that these businesses continue to be vital contributors to our nation's economy, not only as subcontractors, but also as prime contractors. This is why there was a bipartisan agreement in committee to add language requiring the GAO to, among other things, assess the impact that the enactment of H.R. 3534 may have on disadvantaged business enterprises' ability to successfully bid on federal contracts. This analysis will help us, help us monitor whether H.R. 3534 has any unintended consequences in this regard. I thank Chairman Smith for his willingness to work with us to reach a mutually agreeable result. I also commend the bill's sponsor, Representative Richard Hanna, and Representative Jared Paulus, the lead, the lead Democratic co-sponsor for their leadership on this important matter, and I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves the balance of his time. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas rise? Mr. Speaker, I yield two minutes to the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Mulvaney, who is an original co-sponsor of this legislation. The gentleman from South Carolina is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you to the gentleman from Texas. Uh, this is not, Mr. Speaker, the most glamorous thing we're going to do in this 112th Congress. Um, if you stop to think about it, there's probably not that many people who are aware of or let alone care about what kind of security is offered on, uh, on surety bonds. I can assure you it is important to some people. It really is. If you're the person who's entering into that contract, who's counting on somebody doing that work, the quality of that security in that surety bond is of the utmost importance to you. And as you heard the gentleman from New York mention Mr. Hanna, in certain cases it could be a matter of life or death for your business. So I'm proud to be a sponsor of this bill, but that's not why I rise today, um, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to, to bring to light the fact that we're actually doing something on a bipartisan basis to help the country. 
We get a lot of criticism back home. I know we both do, the Republicans and the Democrats, for not being able to come together to fix things. And yes, we do struggle, perhaps, to fix the big things, and make, maybe rightly so. We're unlikely to solve the issue of taxes versus spending here today. But it's nice to know um, that we're still able to get together from time to time on the small things. Face it, it used to be, before this bill, that you could take marketable coal as collateral on a surety bond. That's outrageous. Uh, with this bill, we'll fix those types of things and actually make it safer to do business on a government contract. Again, is it the big things that stand between our country and its current pro uh, lack of prosperity? Absolutely not. But it does make business better in the United States of America. That's why I congratulate the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Smith, the ranking member, Mr. Conyers. I also thank uh, the gentleman from Missouri, uh, Mr. Graves, and the lady from New York, Ms. Velasquez, from the Small Business Committee, who also took a look at this bill and also passed it on a bipartisan basis. So with that, Mr. Speaker, I thank the gentleman. I thank my colleagues across the way to actually come together today uh, and try and, uh, and do something to, to help the nation advance. And with that, I encourage everyone uh, to support this bill, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman from South Carolina yields back, and the gentleman from Texas reserves the balance of his time. For what purposes does the gentleman from uh, Puerto Rico rise? Mr. Speaker, I have